Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. Today I want to talk about something that's already been discussed but with a different view on the subject and that's the update that Mark Sanderson gave just recently on all the changes that they're making, the beards, the wearing of pants that you know, sisters can actually wear trousers now and um, also you can say the odd greeting as long as your bible trained conscience allows you to to a disfellowship person but i want to pick up on something that they have said in watchtower publications well maybe not so much watchtower publications but they've definitely said it online on jw.org and also in a publication entitled who are doing Jehovah's Will today, which you can find in JW Library app under brochures. The question is on lesson 20, how does the governing body function today? Okay. And then it goes on to say, and I quote in the very first paragraph, in the first century, a small group, the apostles and elders in Jerusalem served as a governing body to make important decisions on behalf of the entire anointed Christian congregation. And then they quote Acts 15.2 or reference Acts 15.2. When they made a unanimous decision, it was the result of discussing what the scripture said and yielding to the influence of God's spirit. That pattern is followed today. All right. So here they're saying in that brochure that they take as an example the first century governing body. But the words governing body don't appear in the scriptures, in, in the Christian Greek scriptures. Okay, so just hold on to that thought. And then in, a, a, I don't know what publication it is, but it's actually definitely on the website if you just type in who is the governing body. They say here, the governing body today follows the set pattern by the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem. In the first century, these ones made important decisions on behalf of the entire Christian congregation. Like those faithful men, the members of the governing body are not the leaders of our organisation. They look to the Bible for guidance, acknowledging that Jehovah God has appointed Jesus Christ as the head of the congregation. And then it goes on to say who the members of the um, governing body are. Now, I just want to pick up on that because here they're saying that they're not the leaders. Please help me out here. If they're not the leaders of the organisation today, then who is? Who are the leaders when they've already just stated in their publications that they actually oversee the direction and um, the feeding, if you will, of its entire members. So that just blew me away because I'm thinking, well, if you're now saying that you're not the leaders, who is? And why do only a small, small group of men keep um, appearing on the jw.org website when it comes to updates? It's always members of the governing body that are making these decisions. And yet they're not the leaders. So why isn't everybody else putting in their... Uh, five cents worth you know why don't they take things to the congregation the local congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses because there was no first century governing body and yet they've even got artwork here um, showing the apostles uh, I mean where was Peter the scriptures where even Peter wasn't part of these decision-making processes and yet they go on and say that the unanimous decision well the word unanimous isn't even in the bible for a start so where's the scriptural references 
to back up what they're actually saying in their literature? Well, I haven't found any scriptural references to say that they can make all of these these um, sweeping changes and doctrinal changes as well, if you will, and expect all the rank and file witnesses to change their beliefs too, because that's essentially what is happening. And yet they claim that they're not the leaders. They also claim that they're not inspired. They're not God breathed or they're not infallible. But yet they're spirit directed. And again, I did mention that in another video that I did. It, the, the spirit doesn't act independently of almighty God. So, why are they given special preference if they believe what they're saying is true in terms of how God backs them? They, they, they are absolutely unbelievable, these men. I mean, surely God, almighty God and his son, would never ever put people who claim to be guardians of the doctrine in charge when they come out with the comments that they're not leaders now. They're not infallible, they're not inspired, and they err in doctrinal matters. And yet, Jeffrey Jackson said in the Australian Royal Commission that the governing body are guardians of doctrine. Guardians of doctrine. And yet, they've got so many things wrong. I just, you know, the plot thickens, doesn't it? When you think about all of this evidence that's coming up, and then Mark Sanderson referencing in the update um, 2 John verses um, 7 through 11, where he actually attributes those verses to apostates because now they've let their guard down a little bit with the changes. People can actually use their Bible trained conscience to say a greeting um, to disfellowship it, Jehovah's Witnesses should they see them. But now they're attributing the second of John, you know, um, verses 7 through 11, which I'm going to read. It says here, and this is from the New International Version. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Well, let's just stop there. Any person, this is John, who does not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh, have gone out into the world and are deceivers, and they, that they are the antichrist. What do Jehovah's Witnesses believe? when Jesus returns, okay? They say that Jesus, they say the misconception, their misconception is that, sorry, many people misconceive that Jesus will come in the flesh, in the words of John 2, 7, that I've just read, okay? They're stating now as fact the Bible verse states, many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those not acknowledging Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. So they've they've acknowledged that. But then they go on to say, in the Apostle John's day, some denied that Jesus had come to earth in the flesh as a man. They were called Gnostics. Second John 7 was written to refute their false claim. So if if... <laughs> uh, if this was the case, think about this, friends. They're actually calling true Christians as Jesus coming to earth in the flesh as a man. Gnostics. And Second John 7 was written to refute their claim. This has got nothing to do with what Mark Sanderson said. Now saying that, um, and I quote, In examining the context of these verses, Second John, um, he actually says 7 through 11, but I've actually started reading 7, 7 through 11. He read nine, seven through nine. In examining the context of those verses, the governing body has concluded. How did you conclude? 
that the Apostle John was really describing apostates. Seriously? So, Mark Sanderson, where is the scriptural reference that says that the scriptures in John are actually referring to apostates when you're actually contradicting yourself? You're talking about yourselves. John said that those who, any such person who rejects that Jesus came in the flesh, right, is the antichrist and the deceiver. In verse 8, watch out that you do not lose what we have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Jesus Christ himself said that he would return the same way that he left. The same way that he left. Right? Because... In Matthew 30, Matthew 24 rather, verse um, 30. It actually says there, then the, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and all the tribes of the earth will beat themselves in grief and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory so everyone will see and that's just one of many many scriptures you know jesus said we that we would see him return as lightning flashes forth from the east so the governing body the these are the ones that are the apostates when you think about it because they're saying exactly the opposite, that Jesus Christ will come invisibly, not in the flesh. So, you know, and then they and then they liken these the truth about Jesus' return as misconceptions. Misconceptions. So, you know, another point that they make. That when the Bible says that people will see Jesus coming on the clouds, it means that Jesus will come visibly. And they say that with such, if I can use the word dogmatism, they're so dogmatic about it. And then they say fact, the Bible often associates clouds with something hidden from view. Doesn't mean to say that it's not there. But the these, these things, and they're using scriptures from the Hebrew scriptures now to try and prove this. No wonder people are confused. But the scriptures at John, John, um, Second John seven through eleven, you know, they are talking about themselves. Anyone who runs runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son which is what true Christians do. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take them into your house or welcome them. So we should be we should be shunning them when you think about it. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked works. Well, what else can I say? But the governing body say that they're not the leaders of the organisation. And we know why, because they want to distance themselves from all the lawsuits, everything that's going off in Europe. And now they're trying to say that they're not part of all of this. But it's too, it's too late. People are not stupid, Mark Sanderson. The governments and the court systems can read right through you as all of us here can too. And it's only a matter of time. It's only going to be a matter of time before the tower falls. And what a day that will be when it happens. Take care, everyone, and look after yourselves. Be kind, show love and be forgiving.